I'd like to welcome each of you to our devotional study today. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We've been looking at prayer and uh, all that we learn about prayer and worship uh, from this particular passage. We've looked at the first couple of verses and we want to pick it up in verse 3 today of 1 Timothy 2. But let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and we'll read the first six verses today. And then pick it up in verse 3. It says there, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we've been looking at prayer these last couple of days, and I mentioned as we closed um, yesterday that there was so much good stuff in verse 3. First of all, we saw that this kind of praying that's talked about in 1 Timothy 2 is prayer that is acceptable to God, and that ought to be what we're looking for. So often today we get um, misconstrued in our prayer life. You know, we get to the place where we think prayer is about my will being done instead of God's will being done. And we have a prayer life that focuses around pleasing us rather than a prayer life that pleases the Lord. And in this, we see that this kind of praying is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So first of all, that ought to motivate us to desire to pray that way, to pray in a way that is acceptable to God, in a way that is pleasing to God. Now, this is in, contrary, in contrast rather to the Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees were a people. The Bible tells us that prayed to be seen of men. They wanted people to think that they were... Uh, some kind of a spiritual or a intellectual leader as people listen to them pray and to be amazed by them. And, and the whole reason they prayed was for the approval of men. And Matthew 6 verse 5 tells us that where it says there in Matthew 6 and verse 5, um, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to stand uh, to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So there we see that the the Pharisees pray in order to be seen of men, and to be and for to please men, for men to be pleased by them. But rather, we should pray to please God. Now that being said, I mentioned there was all kinds of good nuggets of truth packed into this verse. Did you get it as you looked at it and you studied it? Except for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. What a wonderful verse to go to, to prove the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we see here that God is Savior. Um, a couple of verses for contrast to that, Titus 1, 3 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Then in Titus chapter 2 and verse um, 10, it says, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And then notice also with me in Titus chapter 3 and in verse 4, where it says, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. So you see over and over again there, it identifies God as the Savior. But then also we see that scriptures identify that Christ is the Lord and Savior. For example, in Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse 11, it says this. It says, And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Then in Philippians 3.20, it says, For our conversation is in heaven, for amongst also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, putting those two together, you will see that the Bible tells us that God is Savior, and then it says that Christ is Lord and Savior. So when you compare the two of them, it becomes very obvious that what the Scripture is teaching us is that Jesus is God. And of course, we know that, but it's important for us to 
get that from the scriptures. And, and in reality, God and the Father are one. Remember John 10, uh, verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So we see there that Jesus Christ is God. And that's a very important teaching from the Word of God that we must understand. Then we see the pattern for such prayer in verses 4 through 6. First of all, our will must follow the will of God. We see here in verse 4, it says, "...who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is the will of God that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance." First John chapter 4, and in verse 10, it says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So there we see he is the Savior of all men. Then if you come with me to First John chapter 4, and verse 14, we find this truth. It says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. So we can be very clear in our praying when we pray for somebody's salvation because we know that that is God's will. But what we see here, friends, is something that's very important, and that is this, that when we pray, we must make sure that our will is in line with the will of God, that we follow the will of God, that we're just not looking at what's best for us or looking at what we want, but rather we are looking at what God wants. And as we think about all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, it reminds us that as believers that our mission is to the world. Our mission is to get the gospel to the world, to get the gospel to every creature, as Matthew 16 15 says. Notice what Mark 28 verses 19 and 20 have to say about this. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we see there are marching orders as a people of God. That our mission is to take the gospel to the world. That is what Christians are to be doing. That is what New Testament churches are to be doing. And in order to be a New Testament church, we must be involved in the mandate of taking the gospel to the world. That is the heartbeat of God. That has not changed from the moment that God said that to us. And it is not going to change. And then keep in mind also that he says, hey, we'll have all men to be saved and coming unto the knowledge of the truth. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, we saw that our prayer should be for all men. It says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. As I'm thinking about this passage, my thought is, what kind of a heart do you have for the lost? What kind of a desire do you have for them to be saved? How often do you pray for them that God would be at work in their lives, that God would bring them to that place of repentance and faith? And how active are you in doing what you can do to get the gospel to the people that you come in contact with? How faithful are you as a verbal witness as to the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ? As I think about that, I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What's your heartbeat? What's your heart's desire? What's your prayer for people? One of the best things that we can pray for people is that they might be saved. And Paul put feet to his prayers. He did what he could do to impact people, and to share the message of the gospel with all that he came in contact with, mattered not if they were rich or if they were poor, if they were bond or if they were free, Paul faithfully shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Have a great day.